Good. Uh, good morning and welcome to uh, another two, Topical Tuesday webinar. My name is David Orr. I'm the director here at the New York State LTAP Center, the Cornell Local Roads Program. And today's session on winter maintenance uh, will take us about an hour. Uh, it's the second of two we've run this season. So thank you very much. If you are joining us via Facebook Live, welcome. But remember, if you would like to get credit for this session, you need to attend via the Zoom link. Uh, next slide, Jim. So this uh, is valid for Roadmaster recognition. Uh, it's a point in our strange system we're using. Uh, five points equals one webinar kind of thing. Uh, go back up if you can. Yep, there we go. Probably got an automatic feature to move it forward. Uh, but to get a certificate, it is part of a Roadmaster, as we have said before. And you'll get different items for different levels. Uh, we're working on all those things right now. Next slide, Jim. Uh, just so you know, this might be something useful to you. Uh, there's some TC3, as they're called, the AASHTO TC3 Transportation Curriculum Coordination Council has webinars that are free to those who work for local government. You do have to register and get an account with them, but they have a whole bunch of different classes on all kinds of topics. And they just uh, put out a notice. There's some ones out there on snow and ice control that you may find useful. And uh, we'll uh, throw into the uh, chat pod here in a little bit different links that might be useful to you, including we'll put a link for this particular uh, activity here. I'll do that here in just a minute. Also in our chat pod, you can also get a link to our snow and ice control workshop manual. If you'd like to, a lot of the materials we're talking about today are included in there. Next slide, Jim. Uh, as a reminder, audio settings are down to the left. The chat pod is disabled for you to type in, but we will send messages out to everybody, such as the links we're talking about. So you may want to open that up and look for the chat items coming down the pike. Uh, you can raise your hand if there's a question that you've got, uh, but really the, probably the best way to get back and forth with us is to use the Q&A pod feature. We are monitoring that. We've got myself, uh, Amanda Link, and Adam Howell in the background monitoring, watching these things. So we'll make sure we answer your questions as we go along. And we will be doing some polls as we go through the course of this session. Next one, Jim. I think this is the one that you get to start. Yep, our instructor today is Jim Craw. He'll give you a little more of his background, but he's got lots of experience dealing with snow and ice. and. Uh, work for a couple of villages. And today is a pretty good day to be talking about some of these issues. Uh, so Jim, I'll let you take it away. I'm going to go dark and mute, but I'll be here ready if you need a help. OK. Thank you, David. Um, good morning. Um, like it says, uh, I'm Jim Craw, uh, winter maintenance uh, circuit writer for uh, New York State Department of Transportation LTAP Center, uh, Cornell Local Roads. Um, I've got probably close to 40 years, if not more, of, of snow and ice. Um, several villages, Fayetteville, Manlius, and the town of Manlius, uh, over 30, 36 years in, in municipal work. And I've been doing this for five or six years now, so as a circuit rider. So I've got a couple of years in it and going around the state and learning about. Uh, what you people do, and how you do it, and basically what we try to do is just give you some more tools in your toolbox so that um, you know maybe you can you can get a little better at what you do, use or don't use. It's entirely up to you. Um, Adam, uh, first question is how long does it take you to complete the plow loop? Um, you could answer that. Oh. Sorry, Jim. I had the I had the wrong one queued up. I can I can queue up the. Uh, or wait the, a minute. I'm sorry. That's not me. That was yeah. So just give me one second. Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. The, this question is just to find out what people are using um, within the system. Um, do you use Salt brine, use organics with calcium, organics with mag magnesium, 
or a blend would normally be something like uh, salt brine and um, or an organic or there's also beet juice out there that kind of stuff but, uh, that would be considered a blend to me um, once we find out where we are with with you know what we're doing here um, it may be a little easier for me to figure out you know where we where we need to go with some of this stuff Okay. I'm going to give it a few more seconds. We're at only about 36% people who have voted. Yep. And there's the results. Okay, so it looks like majority of the attendees are using a, a salt brine, um, probably by itself. Then there's some using blends, which is fine. Uh, you know, they're all good tools for our in our toolbox. We just need to, um, you know, just use it the way it should be used. We, we want to be careful of how we use it when we use it. Um, Trying to get to the next slide and it's not going. All right, I can't get this to move, Adam. So try hiding, try hiding the pole. Make sure the pole is hidden first. Pole's gone. I clicked it off. There we go. So winter maintenance. Um, we're going to talk about liquids and solids. Um, basically, this is just a picture of a, a newer type truck that's totally automated. Ground speed control is extremely important. Um, if you don't have ground speed control, you really should. Um, all your vehicles should be calibrated at least once a year. Um, if you have any, do any maintenance to your truck, the hydraulics and, and, and the likes, change the chain. Um, they should be recalibrated. Um, you can save a lot of material if you cal keep calibrating. Just lost me again. I got no. Okay. Second question, Adam. How long does it take to complete a plow roof? <clears throat> Should be able to see the results. Okay. So it looks like most everybody's running around three hours for a roof. Um, that seems to be pretty much a standard, and that's a good. It's a good, good time um, to get around your roots. One of the things that we we found that if our roots are too short, <clears throat> what we do is we get back on them too soon if we have to make a second trip. Um, what happens then is you, you take all the material off in the road that you just put down. You need that chemical to, to work as long as it possibly can and still be effective. Um, at higher temperatures like the storm we just had, the key to that was, you know, get on it early and, and, and um, get something on the bottom. Um, a case of today's storm that we had here in central New York, um, uh, what the best thing to do with a, a storm like today, I had some people that I know that went out super early, like midnight when it started changing over to freeze and rain, a little bit of sleet. Uh, that's fine. But if you've got snow on the ground, you're better off leaving it there, leave the snow on the ground, and then apply your materials after that, and then it'll clean right to the bottom. Okay. 
the next question is uh, where do chlorides go after they are applied to the road? Um, do they stay on the road or they're dropped? Do they scatter to the sides into the road, um, roadside plants? Uh, passing vehicles uh, dissolves into the snow and ice. We'll get into this a little bit here as soon as this poll is done, but actually we can do it now. The, there's been a, a lot of studies done on chlorides. Chlorides means your salt, your um, magnesiums, your calciums, um, pretty much anything that we add to the salt or the salt itself. One of the big pushes right now um, throughout the country, throughout the world, basically, as far as um, chlorides, is we're trying to reduce the amount of chlorides we put, put onto the, the road surface. <laughs> the chlorides dissolves into the snow, you're right, in the ice. It goes to the roadside plants um, and it's scattered through the sides and the whole thing. But once a chloride is a chloride, it stays a chloride forever. So the problem is that as we keep applying the chlorides to the roads, eventually that chloride gets to your waterways. And they found this in, they found chlorides in the bottom of lakes, um, ponds, uh, wells, and that's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And it doesn't take a lot of chloride to settle into the bottom of the, of the lakes. What it does is it goes into the lake or pond, um, any, any settling area, and it drops into the bottom. And eventually that stops anything from growing on the bottom. Uh, so what happens is the lake, if you get too much in the bottom of the lake, normally the lake or pond will turn over, usually twice a year. With chlorides, what's, what they're finding is if it's, if it's oversaturated in the, in the water body, that it doesn't, the, the lake or pond doesn't turn over. So it doesn't have a natural cleansing. So what happens is it settles to the bottom and they're finding higher and higher concentrations of chlorides at the bottom or low spots in and around the lakes. Same thing kind of happens with, with sand. If you apply, apply a lot of sand, it settles to the, into the ponds, lakes, streams, and it fills all the voids up and, and then, then it can't be used. Basically, and then what happens is it becomes a, uh, called a BOD, biochemical oxygen demand. It reduces the oxygen in the uh, waterways. So that's one of the reasons we have to keep an eye on this. The Adirondacks, uh, the state just had a, a, has passed a law that they're gonna do a study on um, the chlorides being used in the Adirondack region inside the park um, that's that'll be a continuing uh, thing to go on with so that's where we are with our chlorides um, we have to be careful of how much we use our biggest thing here is to try to reduce the amount of chlorides we use make it more effective um, some of the chemicals also grab um, heavy metals in the in the uh, in the ground It'll grab them and hold them in suspension and it'll gather up in different places wherever it settles to. But we do have to pay attention to that. Another issue now has become the uh, use of, of um, salt brine water, salt water, or brine water, or material that's being pumped out of the gas wells. They're finding um, heavy metals and a whole bunch of bad stuff in that. So basically the state says you're not supposed to be using that anymore. I know it's, it was free to everybody and the concentration of salt is not high enough. The concentration of salt must be 23.3% uh, and that's 100% of uh, suspended uh, salt in water. Okay, I can't get the next slide out. So as we talked earlier, and we'll keep going back through these kind of same stuff, um, calibration of, a, of your, your sander, 
um, extremely important. If you can get a uh, ground speed control, um, basically it's around, I don't know, $2,000 or so. You'll, you'll save that much in salt product um, in one season if you have ground speed control. That need, most of those have a, a self check or a, um, they can calibrate themselves. This chart here is on the, on, uh, is from Cornell. Um, it was made up by Jeff. He's the, one of the engineers at Cornell. <clears throat> um, what this is a spreadsheet and a very good video on this um, is a YouTube video and you can search that by um, looking at salt spreaders calibration um, and it'll, it'll pop up for you. There's a bunch of them on there. One very good one is out of Michigan. Um, if you have to do manual, that's the way to, to do it. So what you would do is you put a, you would mark the shaft on the auger or the, uh, on your, uh, yeah, on your chain. Mark it for wherever it's gonna be, set your RPMs at whatever the RPMs are gonna be, usually around 1700 RPMs. Count the number of revolutions on that. Um, on the discharge side of it, put a pail or a, a bucket, something underneath your um, spinner chute, shut the spinner off or swing the spinner to the side, um, count the number of revolutions. Um, that would be like 22 pounds of material comes out of it. You would, you would weigh it on a scale, bathroom scale will work. Your discharge rate at that point would be 143. So what you would do with this is you would populate the first two chart in this uh, spreadsheet. It's downloadable from, uh, from Cornell. Um, load those two numbers in and the rest of it will populate for you. As you can see, um, as the faster you go with the, the same RPMs, that gives you your uh, poundage that's gonna be applied per lane mile. Very simple. But a lot of people don't do that. And if you don't know how much you're spread, you know, it's a bad thing. Uh, one example I had was that we had, I know there was a department near me. We started talking about uh, salt applications and they were like everybody else. You filled the truck up. You, most of us had six wheelers or 10 wheelers, depending on what we were doing. Fill it up, do your route. And basically what everybody would do is make sure that the truck was empty when you came back. Well, when they started calibrating, they found out that they were, they were applying like eight or 900 pounds per, per mile. Uh, when you were only use, needing someplace around 150 to, to 250 lanes per, pounds per mile. So in that case, you're, you're over applying the material and it's costing you a lot of money. Uh, so you know, wise to try to try to get it right. Next slide. There you go. Um, what we all have to do is we have to figure out what our level of service is, is required or what we feel or your board feels or your, your public feels. Years past, we just plowed. We didn't use much salt. We always had snow on the road and everybody got along pretty well with it. But the increase of the traffic, you know, public safety, um, we've all basically gone to, without saying it, and I'm you know, putting it into any, any written form, that we have a bare road policy for most of us. It's not liked a lot in the Adirondacks and where people snowmobile and have to use the roads, but I guess that's what we have to deal with. I still have people say, why don't you just let the snow stay on the road? It's not a big deal, you know, but the cost of cars and accidents, insurance, so, you know, you've got a chance to make this right and you wanna make sure you do the best you can at the most cost effective and safety is extremely important today. You certainly don't want your family to be out there driving and run off the road because there was, you know, stuff on the road for the last three or four days. We try to get that off. 
and then you also have to be um, environmentally responsible. But you have to you have to figure a level of service that you want to give to your customers, and our people are our customers. Everybody that drives on our roads are our customers. Jim, real quick. Yes. Uh, I just checked the spreadsheet. I couldn't find. I don't think we've got it currently linked on our website, but we will get it posted and we'll put a link to that next to the recording of this webinar. Yeah, that's so a, those who'd like the spreadsheet, we'll make sure there's a link available uh, here pretty quick. That's an excellent spreadsheet, and you can even use it if you have an automated system just to check. We're, check the we're going to put we're going to put the blank version up and then the version with your numbers in it, so people can see what it looks like. Okay. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Um, based on available resources, your payment condition goals at various times during a storm, um, level of effort um, for various storm conditions, party timing and type of treatments of various locations. All important, every, every event we have, every snow event we have is different. Um, this year, the last two storms that we've had here in central New York um, basically have been nor'easterly. They've had a, a, a lot of water in it, extremely heavy. So the moisture content is up on that. So as you're checking the roads, as even, you know, not just your foreman or your superintendent or whoever does your road checks, the drivers should also be paying attention to what's going on. Because um, conditions will change within your own route. Um, volume of material may have to change bunch of places that set their spinners and, and, and uh, augers at the same and they leave them there forever. That's okay if it works for you, but if you if it's 30 degrees out and you only need 150 pounds per lane mile, why would you put down 300, 250? Um, depends on you know your your conditions like I said. Um, level of effort in various storms. If you, I would rather plow um, three foot of snow than I, I'd ever like to plow an inch of snow. Because when you got done, you could see, you could actually see what was going on. Um, the beginning of the storm, you want to make sure you get material on early, or that be liquid, or liquid and uh, rock salt uh, together. Probably the most effective is, is a liquid application with salt, rock salt, uh, much faster, much, much faster reaction time to the, uh, to the freezing conditions. Um, extremely important to get it down before you get any freezing to the road. Um, that'll be, that's, that's extremely important. If you can get material on the road early, um, pre-treat your roads with your liquids if you're using liquids. Um, you won't have any frost that grabs the, the snow and ice and, and freezes to your pavement. You don't want anything to freeze to the pavement. Um, priority timing and uh, types of treatment in various locations we just talked about. Get it down early um, and get it so it doesn't freeze to the, the pavement. Large storms, um, you're getting two, three inches an hour. Um, you should always salt through your storm, you know, salt through the storm because eventually that material is going to be laying on the bottom. But what you'll find out if you get a bigger storm and you keep applying salt at higher volumes, you've got your volumes way back through the middle of the storm. What you'll find at the end of the storm is you'll have this really mealy, ugly slime that stays on the road. And that just is, it's basically what you're doing is, is creating like an ice cream. The salt is acting with the water. Um, it's kind of froze, but it's not really. The best thing to do with that, depending on the storm, if it gets cold the next day, let it freeze up and then and treat your, and plow it and treat it, and you'll, you'll have zero left on the road. Anti-icing uh, strategies. This is what I was talking about, getting it down early. <clears throat> if you get material on the road early, um, and I don't care if it's rock, um, liquids is best. You can apply that up a couple days ahead of time. 
and it stays on the road. The problem with rock is it goes away um, within like 20, 20 cars. It's not on the road anymore. All the all your chlorides, your your rock salt, basically, it only starts working when it becomes brine. So the, what you want to do is get it on the bottom. The brine forms at, at the surface of the road, and will keep the bond from the pavement. You keep the bond from the pavement, you don't get hard pack. Hard pack is 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 a nightmare for anybody that's had it, and most everybody has had it. Um, one of the others things that helps us depending on the road you're on. If you have a high volume road with trucks, you'll have better melting capabilities early because the, the heat from the uh, tires and the, and the compaction will normally break down, at least give, me, give you some driving lanes and you can work from there with it. But you wanna always make sure that you keep that bond off on the road. This is a de-icing. This is, this is after a storm and that's your hard pack. So what you're doing is you're asking your chemical and usually it's, it's rock salt. Um, liquids don't really work really great on the hard pack. But if you use a, a liquid with a, uh, a rock, it'll, it'll work faster for you. Um, what the problem is that the, the rock salt, the salt has to run work its way down through the snow to get back to the, the pavement. And that's the, that's the biggest problem. And it's more trips if you do get hard back. So if you can get that right to the bottom early, get them plowed off, then you, you, you'll eliminate that problem. Um, in some of the procedures we have is pre-treat um, lanes per mile. Um, it's you'll do that ahead of time, um, as early as you can, but not too early with with rock liquids. Like I said, you can go ahead of time. Um, pre pre wetting is what you would do. Um, example is a, is an onboard system. Onboard systems, if you're not familiar with them, they're usually a, a poly saddle tank um, and the material sprayed on your salt or salt, sand salt at the spinner. Um, that, gives, that gives everything a pre-wetting uh, chance for the rock salt to, to become brine and it coats the coats your material and when it hits the ground, it starts working right away. Your discharge rates, um, lanes per mile, that's where you're gonna use like 150 to 200, 300 at the most. Um, if you're using sand, you're probably gonna have to use about 750 pounds per lane mile, sand salt combination, um, which would actually equal about 250 pounds of rock salt because the sand does not melt anything. It will give you some grit, but that's temporary grit. Um, application rates are liquids and solids, uh, gallons per lane mile. Um, normally 30 gallons, 20, 30 gallons per lane mile for liquids. Um, and if you're using a pre-wet system, uh, an onboard system, you, you, you should be putting about seven to eight gallons uh, per ton. And that's the same thing that you would have when you were, if you mixed in a pile. Um, so people are still mixing piles. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just another, another way to do it. Uh, what this does, what this, these slides are about is where do you put your material? Um, this is the best case scenario. You plow down one side and then come back the other side. You salt or apply material to the center of the road. Reason for that is that if you put your heaviest amount of material in the center of the road, it's gonna eventually mitigate out to the, your shoulders. There's no reason to put your, yeah, next slide. There's no reason to put your material all the way out to the thread shoulder to shoulder. <clears throat> this application would be if you were gonna go, if you had, 
to go down and back and you had a lot of material on it. This is a, you know, the same kind of thing, but if you can do it the, as the first slide, then you were better off. This one here is a full lane. It's not really the best way to do it. Um, we'll show you what happens um, later, the amount of material or where it goes. So what this is doing is you're spreading your material out a long ways and eventually it gets into the shoulder faster than it would if it was in the in the center. You get it in the center, you gotta keep it in the center. Next. This is a no-no. <clears throat> this is where you're you're throwing a lot of material out across the whole whole road. Not a lot of reason to do that. Um, because you're taking the, the the bigger part of your material and you're putting that spreading it throughout the road and it's not going to work as, as actually as fast as it would if it was down down the center of the road next this one here is just a over application of one spot um, what i'm finding is the is, is better <clears throat> now because most of us are using um, rear delivery center delivery uh, sanders Another option now, since we have live hydraulics or live uh, bottom dump truck dumps, is to have a have delivery behind the cab on the center of the road. That way, it's a lot easier to control that material when it hits the, the center of the road. Okay. okay. Would you use salt brine if it was more available? Is there, you already use, already use salt, Brian, would use it if available, would you not use it? And Jim, while you're uh, getting those answers in, someone mm -hmm. in the Q&A pod asked us, what do you use in the pre-wetting system tanks? I think you talk about that later, do you not? Um, yeah, I can answer that now, some of that now. Um, what you use in the pre-wetting tanks is you use, you use your brines, your liquids. Um, you can use salt brine. You can use the egg with the byproducts. Um, it's a lower rate, which is good. Um, but you can use anything to add to your salt. Uh, one analogy that I use with my, my liquids does anybody that's been in the fire service, you know, used to be everybody in the highway department was in the fire service. We always had water and it was the, you know, that's, that was a standard. To put it to this way, we have salt now, but if you want that salt to be better, you need to add a liquid to it for a couple of reasons. One is the salt will start working right away. And two is if you use an ag product, the ag product will will grab onto that. It's a it's a carbohydrate. It's a it's a sugar based basically. Most of it's a byproduct of leftover stuff that will grab onto your salt and make it sticky and stay on the road longer, better. If you use a magnesium or calcium, then that what that does is takes the freeze point, protect it down lower so it'll last longer. And it makes the salt stay alive longer on the road later because the liquids really don't have a, a huge melting cap capability by themselves. But if you put a rock salt with it, then um, it'll go. So it looks like um, most people are not available. Salt brine's not available to them for the most part, understandably, because I don't know anybody selling it right now close by. All right, thank you. Um, there's two forms of chemicals we use. It's either a liquid or a solid. And if you can use these two in conjunction, you'll, you'll increase your melting capacities um, two or three fold. Um, the advantages of a chemical of the solid side, they cost less. Um, they're easier to handle. They um, dilute slower because they're solids. Um, initial skid resistance 
will is salt when it first goes onto the road. There's a little bit of there, but it breaks down fairly quickly. Um, liquids, liquids will work the minute they hit the road. Um, almost all the way down to around 20 degree, 20 below zero, um, if you use a mag or a calcium. A lot of people think that, you know, salt brine is the answer. The salt brine is, is really the beginning. Um, but to, to help you, um, a friend of mine had told me not long ago, the reason that they use their, they use your additives to them is it's an insurance policy for that salt and brine to work down at the deeper temperatures and it'll melt a lot faster. Um, liquids don't displace. Um, like rock salt do, they, they stay where you put them. Um, residual may, remains effective um, after the storm because of the uh, sugars in them or the carbs in them. They stay sticky on the road and it stays where you put it on the road. They don't wash out right away unless you have a lot of rain. Um, what we found is that the, the more events we have in a row, the better residual you have at the end of a week or two, and, the, and the, right away you, you have uh, melting underneath, and you'll have uh, black roads when you plow them the first time. Um, okay, disadvantages: the solids need moisture. That's why we're saying you know put some brine or, or additive to your your rock salt. It doesn't do anything if it's really cold out, if you've ever had below zero, well below zero temperatures, 10, 15 below zero, zero sometimes, and you spread salt, rock salt alone, it'll sit there until it can start, the, the moisture can come up. If there's no humidity, then the, you're not gonna get any moisture. Um, and it takes a lot, it takes longer for the rock to start than the uh, liquid. Liquid is instant. It's not good for anti-icing, bounce and scatter to place, displaced by traffic. Um, liquids are about 70% water, regardless of what you're, you're mixing with them. Um, they're not useful on th thick ice and rain will wash them off the pavement quickly. And some of the chemicals, um, calcium for one, um, and magnesium can do the same thing, but calcium seems to be get to be a problem if the if you apply it dry and the temperatures drop down and the humidity comes up, the calcium becomes a slime on the road and can be can be slippery. You know, it, it's any chemicals we put down, there's adverse conditions that we can find with every chemical we use. We just want to try to make get the best thing we can get. It's going to stay working the longest and it's not going to break the bank. Okay. Um, abrasives. If we're still using sand, and I know a lot of people are still using sand um, because we have our own gravel beds and sand appears to be cheaper. Um, in reality, they're not cheaper because you have to bring it in, mix it, apply it, and then you have to do the cleanup after the storm. And it actually ends up about $2 a ton more if you use abrasives um, than straight salt. <clears throat> Your quality considerations, you got to make sure that you're using the right sands. Like I said, most of it, anybody that uses sand in the a lot of places has their own uh, gravel bed. Um, you got to make sure that you're consistent with your uh, material. Um, not a lot of clays um, and, and it has to be cleaned up. Uh, one, one issue with the braces in the uh, state of Utah, after every event, they have to, they have to sweep the roads because they have uh, a lot of environmental issues out there and they, they don't want the dust in the air. So they have to sweep after every, every event, which can be kind of tough. Um, storage and handling, um, how you're gonna store it, where you're gonna store it, um, should be covered. 
even though most don't, uh, because you will use, lose more salt out of a uh, sand salt percentage wise than straight salt if it was uncovered. Next. Uh, what a relative cost. Um, these numbers aren't really right overall, uh, but you know, if you're going to use use the materials, these are just general. If you just use the numbers, salt per ton is I don't know, like sixty something this year, depending on where you are. Um, stockpile per ton is fifty five bucks because you have to mix it. Um, mag chloride is a dollar something, and calcium is a dollar. Uh, mag and organic, um, calcium and organic is about a dollar 33 a gallon i think we're paying now um salt brine um site made um, the old number was six cents a gallon but david and i have had some some uh, discussions about what it really costs because we really need to find out what it's costing us to do our do work the if you make salt brine yourself it's closer to 40 cents a gallon because you have to add in your, your loader, your buying of the, of the, of the uh, salt, your labor, and your uh, salt brine uh, maker. So it's closer to 40 cents a gallon rather than, than six cents. Uh, these all have to be changed. I've done a lot of research lately. Um, common ice chemicals are sodium chloride, which is rock salt, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, organics and carbohydrate with uh, chemicals, calcium, magnesium acetate, and, and potassium acetate. They're all chlorides, okay? So whatever we've got, we talked about that with the environment, they're all chlorides, so we really don't want to overapply. We want to try to cut those down. If you're using straight uh, organic and doing a pre-treat, um, you're putting down about 30 gallons a mile, you know, so you, you got to figure that out. But like I said, most all, all these chemicals that are liquids are close to 70% water. They all have to be cut. So you're really not getting, you know, 100% magnesium. In it. And even your salt brine is at 23% um, solids, um, salt, and the rest is, is straight water. Okay. Uh, okay, the next one, Adam. If you do not use liquids, is it the cost? Or you're not aware of the products? And Jim, while the answers are coming in, uh, someone wanted to mention that if you're using mag, you need to be careful and make sure you don't have an aggregate issue, which is also true, by the way, for the calciums and the sodium chlorides as well. So, yep. And also, uh, not many choices if it's lower than minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, the, comments? one of the, the, the lower you tactics on, on your magnesiums and your calciums with organics um, is a lot lower than 10 degrees. I've had cases here in Fayetteville, where we've been um, 20, almost 20 below zero, and um, gone out and checked the roads after we've had a snow, light snow, which it does snow when it's cold out. And I had uh, puddles on the road from the uh, mag and salt in combination. So, what it does is it just drops the eutectics lower. Um, everybody says that, you know, like your eutectics, eutectics are are a laboratory thing. They do the testing in the laboratories. They say salt brine is good to down to six degrees. That's in a laboratory. You know, you know what, what it freezes when it gets cold. And you know, everybody here says 20 degrees, but it'll it will go lower than that. But if you use an aggregate product, um, it will drop the your uh, freeze point lower. Well, I think the key you said there was the light snow, Jim. If the dilution potential isn't too high, 
right. they can work a little colder. But if it's a lot of snow, you need to get those plows out there because it'll dilute too much otherwise. Absolutely. The only true way to remove to to get to your where you you want to be on your level of service is to plow it. You have to plow them the majority of material off the road so that your chemicals have a chance to work. If you don't plow them, you can't, don't expect your chemicals to be the, the cure-all because it's not going to happen. Or you're going to use so much material that it's expensive and actually causes other environmental problems. Right. You're over-apply, over-apply, trying to make up for what you didn't do mechanically. I mean, you're going to drive down the road anyway to, plow, to put your, your material on the road. So why not put the plows down? Even your results. Uh, okay. Liquids are too expensive and not oil products. Okay, that's good. The more people we can get to use liquids, I think the better we're going to be long term. Um, pre writing techniques. Um, you can use a stockpile premix, um, stockpile injection, where they come in and they pump a couple thousand gallons into a pile, normally with sand salt mix. And then we used to do that a lot when it got super cold out and we ended up with monster chunks of frozen sand. Um, Truckload treatments, you can treat a lot of different ways on a truck. Um, you can have overhead systems that drop, drop the liquid onto the, the truck. Um, you can have a buck, bucket load, you know, get a bucket and have somebody spraying it. Dump it on the truck and you're on the way to go. The best and most effective way is the onboard systems because it's already there. And the nice part about an onboard system, if it's really warm out, heading towards 30-ish, you don't even need your liquid sometimes. You know, you can you can choose when it when it's used and when it's not. And then your direct application is when you take a truck out and you spray the roads, you know, 100 percent. One of the things with the, the, the direct application is <clears throat> do not use a fan tip if you're going to use direct application. Fan tip, what I mean by those is the ones that spray wide. And they're small droplets. Small droplets will freeze in the air before they even hit the road. And you'll have a whole bunch of ball bearings if you use them brine, especially. Um, you need a, a large droplet that'll get to the road. And then once it hits the road, you should be fine. But if you use an atomized tip, you're going to freeze it because the, the droplets are so small that the cold can get to all of them, okay? But it's salt benefits. One of the, the good things about pre-wetting your salt, whether it be on board or wherever you, however you do it, <clears throat> you have a less, a tendency for less bounce and scatter. Um, what that does is We'll, we've got a couple of slides coming up on those and we'll talk about that. What is salt begins immediately cleaning is achieved with less salt, less effort, and reduced operating costs. So that means that when you go out, you put it down, it'll start working right away. Um, I think I have a slide in here with, okay, David, um, Adam. Do you mix in a pile or pre-wet on board? Don't mix, you mix in a pile or pre-wet. Okay, so you don't mix chemicals, uh, assuming that you don't, you don't mix any liquids. Um, probably 
do mix them salt or you're using straight salt. <clears throat> Pile mixes are, are good. You know, it's just tougher to tough. It's tougher to get that regulated how much material you've got in a pile. Usually you put down a bucket and two buckets of salt or sand, mix it up, throw in a big pile, then you just draw it out as it needs to go. Uh, glad to see there's a bunch of onboard systems out there. Much more effective, actually cheaper to run that than uh, anything else. Bounce and scatter, we just talked about that a little bit. I said we had some slides, here we go. Um, if you put dry salt down and you spread it down the middle of the road, what happens is you only end up with 46% on the, on the center of the road. You've all driven down the road and watched somebody else spread and watch the sand or salt bounce on the road and then fall out to the shoulders because we all have the, a crown in the road. So what you're actually doing is by the time you get done, you're only using about 46% of that material that's staying good, 58% actually. And the rest is all off the road. Right away, it bounces to the side of the road. There's no reason to put material on the shoulders. You know, who cares if the shoulders are melting? You know, you can plow the shoulders anytime because eventually the, the brine gets out there and stays loose. But you don't want, you want all the material you can when you, you apply it when it's pre-wetted. Um, normally at the spinner with these, we're talking about a pre-wet system, pretty much. Um, even if you're doing per truck or whatever, you're still getting some, some liquid on that. So you're gonna end up with 78% in the center of the road. Most effective place to have it is where you need it. There's no sense in putting that material where it's not gonna do you any good. Like I said before, you put it in the center of the road with the crown, you're going to get the salt's going to turn into brine. It's going to grab the moisture, and the moisture is going to eventually mitigate out. Um, you just have to be, be vigilant and, and keep that in the center of the road the best you can. Um, it, it, just, it just proves that you can use less salt because you get 78% in the center than you would if you didn't. And it's more effective in the center of the road. Um, you can get 30, around 30% 30 reduction in salt use taken as a reasonable measure um, with pre wetted salt. And this is a, it's been proven that you use less salt if you can keep it in the center of the road. Uh, application rates. These couple slides are out of the um, Clear Roads um, project that is there. You can get their best management practices this week. So on, online, a lot of the information that, that we all use came from the studies that they had been doing before. What it says here basically is a, is a snow, your uh, calcium, or your salt, your mags, your calcium, um, application rates in a dry, dry system at uh, around 30 degrees-ish, 32 degrees, 30 degrees. That whole, this whole program is in the book there. So what it's telling you is that at 32 degrees, you use 120 pounds of salt, 160 per lane mile. Um, as it goes lower in temperature, you know, dry snows, snows, you know, either way, it's pretty much the same numbers. But if you're down around 15, 20 degrees, um, you're going to be putting 200 to 250 pounds dry salt because you have to over apply to make up for that lag in temperature uh, of time that you're going to, the material is going to start being used. So those are your application rates. Um, when you're using liquids, you're using 20 to 60 gallons and you know, those tables. But 
same kind of thing goes with this one. With the heavier snows, you're going to have to jack it up just a little bit. Um, you know, 150 to 200 is max on that slush and, and rain, 180. Um, and you get down to the 15 to 20 degree range, you know, you're looking at 300 to 350 pounds. So like we said in the beginning, every event is different depending on temperature, depending on snow types. Um, in our case, and most of the state has the same thing. If we've got lake effect, it's, it's a drier snow. Um, and we can plow it easier. And if it's a if it's a northeasterly, it's wet and heavy. So you're going to have to apply into it. But the nice part about northeasterly is more normally the temperature is up higher. It's not usually bitter cold, super cold. Um, so you know that's pretty much what we've got going. You, you, you just got to apply, apply, apply. So Jim, just a couple yes. of quick things. Uh, one is I put in the chat pod. A link to those best management practices from the Clear Roads organization Perfect. for those who are interested. Perfect. And uh, had a couple of quick questions. We got about five minutes after that. Yep. Uh, one of them had to do with one of the last poll questions. You could have added uh, another category on purchasing pre treated salt with premium liquid already added, mm -hmm. um, just so folks know. And then the other one uh, can you uh, discuss the effect of truck speed on spreading? Yes, truck speed on spreading. Um, you really shouldn't be doing much more than 20 miles an hour. Ideally, 8 to 18 that you're plowing and, and sanding. Um, one thing with ground speed control, it automatically adjusts to your speed of your truck if you've got the automation. If you don't, then you're going to have to you're going to have to throttle the truck back and, and slow it down a little bit to maintain the same amount. But the more RPMs you get, um, the faster that is going to you know, spin. And you can see that on the, uh, if you get that calibration chart, you can see it in there. The best is not to go too fast. Just get it on the ground, especially if it's not pre-wetted, because it's going to bounce even worse if you're going faster than if you had a pre-wetted with an egg in it, especially the egg will grab onto it and set it on the road. Um, what was the other part of that question? The other question? It's just an alternative choice uh, okay. for the last yeah. question. We can move on. Yep. Um, what this, this chart shows <clears throat> is the, the amount of uh, ice that this will melt um, with the different products. At 30 degrees, um, rock salt will melt 46 pounds of ice. At zero degrees, it only melts 3.7. As you can see, that's why you would, you would apply different. Um, calcium, being a liquid, um, it's 31 pounds. Magnesium is 47. So it's all relative to the temperatures and how much it uh, will uh, melt. And how? And then the next slide. Uh, okay. Okay. This is just a, a phase diagram of, of brine. Um, at twenty three percent, that's the low, the red line at the bottom where they meet the, the, the V shaped line. Is brine? Brine works very well at that that concentration. But the, what happens is, you know, there's the it's a eutectic. Okay, so this is a this is a laboratory test, but the minute that that brine comes out of concentration, it freezes faster. So if you you put it down, and it, and the the liquid over the water overflies over powers the brine because of the melting, then you'll end up with a free a faster freeze back. That's why you would put rock with brine, and it would last a little longer because. You're, you're forming new brine at the bottom with a new, with a rock every time. Okay. Next. Um, this phase dry diagram is different chemicals. Basically, uh, this is all in the uh, best practices. It just tells you that your freeze points all the way through um, where it works the best and how deep it'll go. 
The calciums and magnesiums, of course, are down. It's 10 o'clock. Down low enough. Next, sorry. And then direct application, that's what it is. Next. Um, basically, we just talked about before is your organics enhanced. Next. We'll fly through these here. This is what organics are made from. They're all leftover stuff. Byproduct. Okay. Advantages. Uh, we talked about those a lot already. Um, next, organic stick better. Disadvantages. There's an odor to them. They're a lot thicker. There can be some windscreen issues um, on, on uh, pine trees and like the such. Cost is a little bit higher, of course. BODs. Okay. And that will do it for me. Uh, anybody has any more questions, you can call me um, oh. my number or email me or get a hold of David and we talk often. So, All right. Well, we, we do have three questions. We have a couple of minutes. I know we're running a little over, but since okay. people ask questions, let's answer them. Uh, first off, is there any specific facets you know about de-icing of sidewalks or differences between a road and a sidewalk? Uh, pretty much the same. Um, sidewalks, the problem with sidewalks is that you're using the chemical, regardless of which one it is. Um, they all have an effect of, uh, with the concrete, with spalling. Um, you need to under-apply at best uh, and try to get the, get the material off it after it's used, because the longer the salt, the, the chloride stays on the, uh, the concrete, the better chance it's going to break up because most sidewalks aren't treated yet as far as um, doing a spray after you've poured them. They're not sealed properly or enough. Yeah, I would say the big thing is it's actually the construction. Sealing and don't over water them when you put them down. It's probably the most, single most valuable thing you can do to protect them. Keep the structure of the concrete where it needs to be. Um, pour it with a, a low slump or a high slump and uh, you know don't put too much water with your concrete and don't work don't over and don't over finish it right because you're going to broom finish anyway so just bring the cream up and then broom it get away from it uh do you have an approximate cost to retrofit a plow truck with a pre-wetting system um the best number i had was um i don't have it with me but it, it was I'm guessing someplace around fifteen hundred dollars, and that that would do um, the tank, the hoses, of course, your pump, um, and the switching for it. And is that just the parts, or is that the labor too? That was the parts, I think it was. Uh, most of your most of your plow companies that are selling plows, vendors, have got the most of that stuff, and there's a few. Um, vendors around the state now that are doing um, doing that you have all the product for you they're not really hard to put on um, it's just a matter of getting a place for it on the truck and, uh, okay and then one last question um, it says here has beet juice picked up and following your use and I actually really probably should discuss all of these uh, inorganic waste products right um, beet juice is is not real popular in New York. Um, it's mostly a Midwest product. Um, but that's where they make the beet. So guess what? It's lower yeah. transportation cost. Right. And there's also, a, they're trying to do, they did a big study out in Washington or someplace out there in Alaska that they're, they're not going to try to use the beet, the product they use now, but they want to now try to take the leaves from the beet and process that because it's supposedly environmentally more, more friendly. Uh, but the beet, the product that I'm aware, I'm familiar with <clears throat> has several chemicals in it, uh, mag and, and calcium. Um, you know, it's, you're putting more chemicals into a product. Um, it all works, all the organics work, if it's corn or, or whatever it is, but the thicker the material, basically, in my opinion, the better off you're going to be. 
it, it all comes down to the balance between what they do well and what they don't do well, as we had in the slides and discussion. So thanks, Jim. Nice job. Thank you. Um, thanks for staying with us, those who stayed on a couple of extra minutes. We'll get out certificates to you here pretty quick. Um, Y'all have a great day. Everybody stay safe in this weather. And thanks again for uh, taking care of the roads for those of us who travel on them every single day. Talk to you all later. Bye, Jim. Yep, thank you.